Every member of the crew will have had basic training in fighting fires. However, experience shows that in many real fires, some people panic and cannot operate equipment correctly. This film will give you a reminder of the basics of firefighting and help prepare you for an emergency. Ideally, you should watch this film with at least two of your colleagues, so that you can discuss what you've seen. We will ask you some questions at the end of the film, so that you can reflect on what you have seen and heard. Most big fires start from small ones. This might seem obvious, but it outlines the necessity to react to small flames before they spread. Burning torches, overheated fat pans, and poorly disposed of cigarette ends are just a few things that can cause fires that threaten the safety of the whole vessel. When used properly, portable extinguishers are an effective part of first response. There are four main types that are normally found on a vessel: water, foam, dry powder, and carbon dioxide. Weighing no more than 23 kilograms, they are designed to be operated by hand. It's important to familiarize yourself with the location of fire extinguishers, the type of extinguishing agent they contain, and the way in which they are operated. It's also essential to identify the right type to use, as the wrong extinguisher can make a situation worse. To understand how these work, we must first understand about fire itself. For many years. Firefighting training was based on the fire triangle. This suggested there were three elements required for a fire to ignite: fuel, oxygen, and heat. But a fourth element has since been added, and it is now known as the fire tetrahedron. Chemical chain reaction is rapid oxidation that allows combustion to take place, and all four parts have to be present to produce fire. The principle of fire prevention is to stop all four elements coming together, whereas the technique of firefighting removes one or more elements from a fire that has already started. If oil or gas is burning from a broken pipe, simply shutting off the gas supply stops the fire. On a vessel, remote closing valves can be used to shut off the supply of burning fuel. When closed, fire dampers and vent flaps. Starve a fire of oxygen. Portable fire extinguishers are an integral part of firefighting. Your company procedures will include guidance on how and when they can be used. In the event of a fire, the first action is always to raise the alarm. The immediate area should be assessed, as should the likelihood of being able to extinguish the fire. Identify the availability of a portable extinguisher and its suitability for the fire. It may be important to isolate power or close a compartment if required. Finally, identify an escape path. This assessment should tell you if you're able to use a portable extinguisher. If the fire is inaccessible, too far advanced, or about to cut off your escape route, you should not attempt to put the fire out. In some cases, company procedures permit an approach. But they may require additional personnel to be present to ensure a coordinated attack on the fire. When company procedures allow for independent use, portable extinguishers.
can prevent small fires from becoming major disasters. The International Maritime Organization classifies fire according to type, recognizing two standards that define the nature of the burning material. These have been developed by the International Organization for Standardization, or ISO, and the US-based National Fire Protection Association, NFPA. Portable fire extinguishers are described by the class of fires on which they can be used. These are the classes of fire according to the ISO standard. Class A fires involve solid materials which are usually organic, where combustion occurs with the formation of glowing embers. Class B fires involve liquids or liquefiable solids. Class C fires involve gases. Class D fires involve metals. And Class F fires involve cooking oils. The ISO standard uses very similar terms to the NFPA standard, but there are two very significant differences. Instead of being Class C, as they are in the ISO standard, Fires involving flammable gases form part of Class B under the NFPA standard. Similarly, fires involving cooking oils and fats form part of Class K under the NFPA standard, rather than Class F as listed in the ISO standard. The NFPA standard also has its own class for fires in energized electrical equipment. Whereas the ISO standard considers that electrical fires can happen across the other classes and does not distinguish them with a class of their own. It's important to identify which standard your ship operates under, though the type of extinguisher and the kind of fire on which they can be used will be indicated on the label. The vast majority of portable fire extinguishers have red bodies, but a small number have polished aluminium or stainless steel bodies. These are mainly found on cruise liners and ferries, where the colouring is used for decorative purposes. In order to identify the type of extinguisher, it is mandatory for there to be a coloured panel, up to a maximum of 5% of the external area, displayed above the operating instructions. There will also be a card attached or a label stuck on, showing the last service and inspection dates. The contents of many extinguishers are expelled with compressed air, so you should never take off the top of one before first making sure that there is no pressure left inside. The pressure inside an extinguisher can be introduced at a service depot. This is called stored pressure, or it can be created by a charge of compressed air, fired from a bottle inside the extinguisher when the handle is squeezed. In this situation, we have a Class A fire. Class A fires are carbonaceous type fires. We select a fire extinguisher which has got the appropriate icon for a Class A fire. First of all, I need to withdraw the safety pin from the extinguisher. Before charging, it's important the extinguisher is at arm's length, so if the extinguisher does fail, I'm not going to incur any injuries to myself. I'm then going to take an overhand grip on the discharge hose and I'm gonna briefly charge the extinguisher. And then operate the handle again to assess the depth of throw that I have for that extinguisher. I'm expecting about six meters with this extinguisher and the water should last for about 60 seconds. I'm now ready to approach the fire. In doing so, when I pick up the extinguisher, I'm now looking for my overall safety. I'm gonna use that extinguisher until it's fully empty. In this scenario, we have a Class B fire, a liquid fuel fire. I need to check that the extinguisher is appropriate for a Class B fire by looking at the pictogram. I then need to take out the safety pin 
and by keeping at arm's length for my own safety, I will then charge the extinguisher. I will now check the throw of the extinguisher, which I expect to be approximately four and a half meters. The throw of this extinguisher should last for about 45 seconds. I will then proceed towards the fire. By allowing the foam to flow across the surface of the fire, we're creating a blanket of foam across the fuel, stopping the oxygen from getting to the fire and extinguishing the fires through suffocation. In this scenario, we also have a Class B fire and have chosen to use a dry powder extinguisher. I will check the pictogram to make sure it's appropriate for the type of fire that I'm going to extinguish. We will then take the pin out of the extinguisher and charge the extinguisher. I will then approach the fire. In this scenario, we also have a Class B liquid fuel fire. However, we've chosen to use a carbon dioxide extinguisher. This type of extinguisher may also be used with fires involving electricity. The extinguisher is very loud. It has a frosting effect because it's a compressed gas. So when utilizing the extinguisher, it's important that we hold it by the discharge handle. We must never use a discharge tube. The extinguisher is also carbon dioxide, so it does inhibit the oxygen. So in a confined area, it may also restrict our ability to breathe. So it's important that we're aware of the problems that we may face. Check the extinguisher has got class B or suitable for electricity related fires. and we will remove the tamper seal. We are now going to take the safety pin out of the extinguisher and holding the extinguisher with the discharge handle, we're going to test the extinguisher and charge it. We're happy that the extinguisher is working, so now we approach the fire. Taking into account our own safety, we approach to approximately two meters. This extinguisher will last for approximately 22 seconds if discharged fully. When we're in position, we'll operate the extinguisher from about 45 degree angle, directing the extinguisher towards the fuel. In this scenario, we have a metal fire and have chosen to use a Class D dry powder chemical extinguisher to attack this fire. We will go through our standard test procedure, identifying whether there's any obvious signs that the extinguisher has been damaged at all. And then we will take the pin out, and at arm's length, we will test the extinguisher to charge the extinguisher, and also check the throw from that extinguisher. With all dry powder extinguishers, we're expecting a range of between three and a half to four and a half meters. We will make our way to the fire, again, taking into account our own safety looking for slips, trips and falls. So far, we have seen the most common types of extinguisher, but there are others. A water mist extinguisher expels an ultra-fine mist of water instead of a jet. The mist is very useful, as it is a general purpose extinguisher and very safe to use on all types of fire, except a Class D fire. A fire blanket is particularly useful to extinguish a pan of oil on fire. If a fire is too hot to get close to, an indirect method has to be used to fight it. This technique involves using a fire hose and directing water towards the source of a fire from a safe distance. This will be combined with some other form of firefighting, such as flooding a space with carbon dioxide. With sufficient water directed towards the fire center, Eventually the heat is removed and any steam produced also acts as a smothering agent. There is a risk of explosion with a very hot fire that has taken hold in a space if the superheated flammable gas around the fire mixes with air. A pressure wave is produced that causes damage and will spread the fire. The vessel's automatic extinguishing system needs to be operating and doors and hatches need to be kept closed to stop the superheated gas mixing with air. Crew can set up boundary cooling to ensure as much heat as possible is removed.
Portable fire extinguishers are designed to be used by a person who has discovered a small fire in its early stages. But if a fire is too big or has taken hold, trying to fight a large fire with a small extinguisher puts you and others in danger. Due to the rate at which heat and smoke are generated, speed is critical when most fires start. As such, whoever discovers the fire is exposed to risk, as it's unlikely they will be wearing protective clothing. We have seen that water extinguishers can increase the dangers of cooking oil fires, but they can also lead to electrocution when used on a fire where there is electricity. If more than one CO2 extinguisher is used in a confined space, the area must be evacuated immediately, as the level of CO2 will be above the requirement of 5% of the net volume of the space. A CO2 extinguisher allocated to a confined space, such as a server room, is limited in size so it will not produce an unsafe atmosphere. When discharging this type of extinguisher, the user should wear gloves and hold the insulated part of the discharge horn. This is because the discharge temperature is typically minus 70 degrees Celsius and will cause a freeze burn to exposed skin. It is important to know the procedures in your company and specifically on your ship. The emergency plan shows what each crew member has to do during an emergency, which includes a fire. The muster list guides you as to your duties, and the fire plan lets you see the vessel's fire systems. Here are some of the typical duties that the personnel on board will have. The master is in overall command and coordinates activity with fire and emergency teams. If the fire is in a machinery space, the chief engineer is usually in charge of the operation. They are also usually in charge of releasing carbon dioxide from the fixed installation on orders from the master. The chief officer is usually in charge of the operation if the fire is on deck or in the accommodation. They will also support the chief engineer if the firefighting party is under their control. The junior officer and helmsman muster on the bridge when a fire alarm sounds. The junior officer usually relieves the duty officer and operates the communications equipment as directed by the master. The rest of the crew will muster at their muster station as instructed. They are usually divided into teams with dedicated roles such as firefighting, support and first aid. The engine room team normally muster in the engine control room, but if this is not accessible, will meet at some other designated place. They will start fire pumps and other machinery when requested, stop ventilation and air extraction systems and close fire flaps. Isolating electrical equipment, operating fire and emergency technical appliances, and possibly starting the emergency fire pump. On hearing the CO2 alarm, all crew must leave the machinery spaces at once and report to the person in charge. The fire control plan illustrates the location of firefighting appliances and equipment on board. The plan shows the vessel's profile and an overview of each deck. It indicates fire zones with their isolating bulkheads and fire doors, manual call points, plant with fire and smoke detectors, alarm buttons and bells, the fixed main extinguishing plant, and where these can be remotely controlled from on board. It also indicates where all portable extinguishing equipment, protection and utility equipment is kept. The plan needs to pass information quickly so symbols and colour are used for marking the position of equipment. There is always a key to guide and help understanding. The fire control plan is found in various locations on a vessel, including the bridge, engine control room and on various decks within the accommodation. When the vessel is in port, it is a SOLAS requirement that a copy of the fire control plan must be available at the gangway. If representatives from the local fire department are on board to assist, they can easily see the plan and immediately become familiar with the vessel's systems. SOLAS requires all vessels to have at least two firefighters' outfits on board to protect the wearer. Their location is shown on the fire plan. They should only be used by trained personnel and should contain a protective suit, 
including gloves and head protection, breathing apparatus, and fireman's equipment such as an axe. When you board a vessel, you should become aware of the vessel procedures as part of your familiarization. This includes what to do if you find a fire. Here are some general guidelines. Immediately shout fire, which is a local alarm. Then activate the vessel's fire alarm system, no matter how small the fire seems to be. If your vessel procedures allow it, try to put out a small fire using a suitable handheld extinguisher. If the fire is too large, exit the space as soon as possible. Close doors, and if you have time, shut ventilators behind you. If you suspect there is a fire behind a closed door, never open it. By opening the door, air is allowed to enter the space, which could make a fire flare up or cause an explosion. The master will probably try an indirect approach to the fire until the extent of it is confirmed. A smouldering or burning fire produces invisible toxic gas and uses oxygen from the air. If the fire is inside a space, consider it as an enclosed space and hence extremely dangerous. On hearing a fire alarm, it is important that everybody musters as quickly as possible where they can be checked against the muster list. Report immediately if you see that any person is missing. Let's listen to what this professional firefighter has to tell us about finding fire on a vessel. The first thing again is to, important that we raise the alarm locally by shouting fire, fire, fire to inform anybody in the immediate vicinity that we have a fire situation. Secondly, we go to the nearest call point and alert the entire ship's crew low, uh, on a wide scale. We must then contact the bridge and inform them of what's on fire where the fire is, how many people are involved, and what action I'm going to take uh, in a, as an emergency firefighter. Fires are extremely dangerous, especially on board ships. Portable fire extinguishers are an effective part of first response and can prevent a small fire from becoming a big fire which can be the difference between life and death. Remember too, follow the safety guidelines on board the vessel. Identify classes of fire and their causes, as well as the types of extinguishers and where they should be used. Prepare yourself so that in the event of a fire, you will know what to use and how to use it. It's also important to recognize when an extinguisher should be used. Using the wrong type at the wrong time could be worse than doing nothing at all. Fire dampers are an essential part of the firefighting equipment on your ship. Do you know where all of them are on your ship? And are they regularly checked for correct operation? Have you ever taken the time to take a good look at the portable fire extinguishers fitted around your ship? Can you say what type they are? And do you agree that they are the right type of extinguisher for the type of material which could catch fire nearby? You should know where to muster in the event of a fire alarm. But where would you muster if you could not get to your normal muster point because of a fire? We eventually saw the crewman put the fire in the waste bin out. But did he act correctly? What actions should he have taken that we didn't see him perform? <laughs>